I and don't any, believe and, that. No, 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 you're wrong. You're just wrong. And That's any your other opinion. Part of your life, I can't be wrong about no, your no, no, opinion. No, 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 no. It's not. Well, I'm I'm operating from the assumption that you care about your health and the health of people around you. So if you have some other foundation, then maybe you have a different opinion. Okay. I under I, only, I concede that. Okay. So if you're somebody that your goal okay. is to be like a super spreader, then sure. Okay. Okay. But like, yeah. Nobody's If you're like a that. if you're a if you're a rational individual, so I wanted to travel a lot, and I do, and I and I like to be around people and stuff. If you want to do that, I didn't get vaccinated because I care about online debates or winning YouTube things. Whatever. I did it because I don't want to get sick. So I like when that. I see people bring up these arguments, who are like, well, it's actually, we thought originally it was going to be 85% protected, but now we see that the data shows there's actually like 50 to 60% protected. Okay. One. Let me just introduce myself and kind of give you a background. Oh like, I don't know if you know this, but I do currently work for one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so I am an actual scientist. I also uh, spent six years in pharmaceutical drug development where we were, you know, submitting INDs to the FDA and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I have a lot of uh, knowledge about the FDA and how that stuff works kind of behind the scenes information about pharmaceutical companies and stuff. Yes, I know. I work for Big Pharma. I'm, I'm evil. Actually, I don't work in pharmaceuticals anymore. I actually work in the... Um, life sciences branch. So we supply materials to the big pharmaceutical companies now. But anyways, okay. so that's kind of my background. Um, I definitely am opposed to vaccine mandates. I think that they're impractical. Um, I think that they're misguided. Uh, and I just want to keep everybody, uh, make sure that everybody still has the freedom of choice, you know, and control over what goes into their bodies. Sure. There's my um... Okay, well, I have, um, <clears throat> hold on, um, so I've been more moderate on this position in the past, but the more that I've thought about it, every single time I revisit this topic to myself, I get more and more extreme in favoring mandates, so I think at this point where I'm at mentally is, um, I think mandates suck and that it's just unfortunate, but I think, I, I think at some point, I think it becomes a reality where if, if you're not willing to participate in society in, in being safe, then you're not really probably shouldn't be allowed to participate in lots of society if you're not willing to take like the minimum levels of, of requirement, I guess, to keep you and other people around you safe. Um, so I think where I stand right now is I'm in favor of schools mandating vaccines. I'm in favor of private employment mandating vaccines. And I'm in favor of like the federal government mandating vaccines for its employees. And I think at this point, I'm probably I think, I think I'm okay at that point. I don't know how you would do like a society-wide mandate for vaccines. I don't know if that's even possible, but right. I, at the very least, I'm definitely okay with those levels. Yeah. Right. So like when you say that you're not in favor of a federal, uh, federally, are, are you saying you're not in favor of federally vac ma mandated vaccines? Like if they were to go to that extreme, would you be in favor of that? I think I would probably fall on the side of being okay with it. It would just be really hard to enforce that. I don't know what that looks like in terms of enforcement. I don't see, I think it's less of an issue with enforcement and more of an issue with like what it's going to do to society. I mean, look at these people who are like legitimately absolutely insane thinking that the government's trying to murder them. So like mm -hmm. for me, I taking more of a pragmatic approach and saying that that's not going to be something that's good for the country. That's just going to further the political divide and just like increase the level of crazy by a thousand. And I don't mm -hmm. really want to go back to 2020. I don't know about you. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it sucks. But I, like, so here, the issue is that at some point, it, it might be like a push comes to shove. Mm -hmm. um, like, let's say hypothetically, let's say that the virus were just as transmissible, but was 100x more deadly. And that mm -hmm. if you got infected, there was like a 25% chance that you actually died. There was like a 50% chance if you survived that you'd be left with some debilitating thing. Mm -hmm. Do you think that people that don't get vaccinated against a virus like that should be allowed to participate in society at large? So I think that's, like, a, you... I've, that's a good, that's something that I've thought about a lot, but I've thought about mm -hmm. it in terms of more like, if this virus were 20% fatal or something, or even like 10% fatal, something like really large number of people were dying. And like, you know how the media sensationalizes shit? Like imagine if like the media were right and like you walked outside and people were just dying in the streets, right? Then I think this would be a completely different issue, but that's not the reality. And you know, we're not there yet. And I'm not saying there's not gonna maybe be some variant or something yeah. in the future, so but I don't think that yet, that's- but... 
Go ahead. We're not there yet, but this is one of those issues where I, I think I would err on the side of being proactive, even if it ends up getting to be a messy affair, because we've gotten to the point now where due to our inability to control things, there is a new variant out, the Delta variant. It is mm -hmm. like two times as infectious as the last one. Mm -hmm. And I don't really know how much longer I want to wait around for people, you know, crying about my freedoms to see if another variant mm -hmm. comes out that's even more infectious or more deadly. And mm -hmm. the, the issue that I have is that getting vaccinated is such a safe and easy and low effort process that if somebody's not even willing to take that step, um, I, I just, I don't have very much sympathy and I don't see how this type of person plugs into society in, in any other way. Cause so, it's like, oh my God. I disagree I, yeah. that it's low effort because like what I'm seeing widely is that people are reporting like, man, I feel like shit for a couple of days, two, three days. Some people don't, some people have just a sore arm or something, but there are actually people who deal with like more side effects than others. And I think that's a legitimate concern, especially for people who are lower income working paycheck to paycheck and like hourly jobs who legitimately can't take two or three days off work. So, yeah, so if I, anything, I, just, I would be I in support okay. of like incentivizing people like that to get the vaccine through like paid time, like companies offering paid mm -hmm. time off or something like that. But I really think that that's one barrier is that there are side effects. This isn't like a normal vaccine where most people don't have any side effects. I mean, would you agree that there's actually quite a few, like, I think that no, it's something like 80%? Not. Absolutely. No, 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 no. Absolutely not. In terms of like side effects that are something that should be worried about. Absolutely. No, not worried about, um, but like, would of, you agree that you might have to miss a couple of days of work? You might have to miss, I think one day of work is, okay. is what I've Do you heard. see why some lower income next. people might, you know, I mean, like, honestly, I, I don't, well, imagine, I don't, I don't know wait, wait, wait. what you're. Imagine, imagine mm -hmm. if you miss one day of work because of the vaccine. Now imagine if you got COVID-19. You're missing two weeks of work. I understand, like, I, like, but I getting COVID this... isn't a guarantee. It's not a guarantee, but how many people in the U.S. have been infected so far? Um, something like 10%, so 1 in 10 chance versus an 80% chance of getting sick and missing work from the vaccine, plus the, op, you know, the idea that there might be boosters in the future where you have to go through it again, because it's two sure. shots. So, so let's say that, let's assume that it's 1 in 10, right? Mm -hmm. um, chances are, if you're working a service job, you're probably going to be overrepresented in that risk, right? You're probably going to be more likely to get it than a normal person, so that might boost you to like one in eight maybe i don't know like so i i take issue with this so the problem is is that you're applying the same rules to every single person in the u.s right obviously a person who lives in new york city and is a frontline worker uh is going to have a higher risk of getting covid than like a rural worker out in the middle of nowhere who you know has very like uh, lives in an area with very low infection rate so for those people they might be seeing oh there's only been like five cases in my whole town for like the last year why would i get the covid vaccine because it's very unlikely i'll ever get it i mean we can say it's unlikely but infections have spread like literally all over the world like there have been huge rural outbreaks where that has happened um, i think initially in this a lot of people did think that like oh yeah like new york la miami like the big city is gonna be the problem but this this virus is way more infectious than that it's not just the flu right like mm -hmm. this is this is affecting a ton of rural areas and it is getting into a lot of different places mm -hmm. um i i just i, I just want to just to return I just want to completely knock down that idea that like getting vaccinated and being like pretty scummy or cum scummy for a day is like a, is worth like risking. Like even if we even if I grant you the 10 percent infection chance, mm -hmm. like you can get vaccinated on, on a weekend, you can get vaccinated on, on one of your two days off. Like there, there's it's so much better to just run the risk of having one shitty day than like rolling the dice every day and be like, well, I hope I don't get the actual coronavirus because mm -hmm. I might be out for two weeks. Or, or even just a week like that's so much worse i guess that makes sense uh some of companies are also offering you know uh covid pay if people are out right yeah, so that's a big a problem minute, i yeah. think because they're inconsistent like my work had done that right so they didn't offer any time off for getting the vaccine but if you got covid you got two free weeks off so i think that that was probably a bit misguided for a lot of companies right would you agree that 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 some companies were doing that um I heard about this happening for schools. I don't know about companies, mm -hmm. but I heard that like kids would fake coronavirus tests for school and they would- How do you like, fake a coronavirus off. test? What the fuck? Well, if we're being honest, it would be incredibly easy to- Wait, have you had any yet? Have I? Yeah, I've had like three of them. Yeah, I mean, you could just, you could fake an email, right? It was pretty easy. Oh, I see um, what you're saying. You could just like, yeah, yeah okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. So the, I, I, I heard, I heard, I don't know if this actually happened. I've heard this a lot repeated. So I'm assuming it probably happened at least once, but that kids at school would, um, would send in like a fake letter saying, Oh yeah, I've got the coronavirus," And they would get like free, like two weeks off. I don't know if this happened or not, but I heard, I heard it enough mm-hmm. that I'm guessing it happened at least one time. But um, yeah, I mean like, I agree that there are ways to like incentivize it and that would be good. In my mm-hmm. opinion, like the, the incentive is, is just there full stop. Like you, I don't want to be sick for a week, uh, especially if you're working class, this all goes up like 20 times more. You don't want to be sick for an entire week and potentially get your family sick too. Um, but I mean, like if people want to offer more incentives too, I, I, I don't guess I'm not necessarily against that. I mean, it's already free, but sure. I am super pro incentivizing and here's why. Like I'm even, and this is kind of deviates from like the rest of my political beliefs, but I'm even in favor of the government incentivizing. I don't know why people get so like, they, they clench their buttholes. Like when they're th- talking about the government offering money or lotteries, they're like, why? Why are you doing that? That's so suspicious. But for me, I think it's a great idea because there are people out there who are shouting, like you said, about my freedoms and my religious beliefs and my medical conditions. And if a donut or even like 50 bucks can like persuade you to get the vaccine, you never really had any of those issues to begin with, right? So I think yeah, but that the it- is, What do you do with this huge swath of US society that can't be incentivized? There's probably like 30% of people or maybe 20% of people that are like, I'm never getting vaccinated because it seems like there do exist like a number of people out there that have that belief. I mean, we've got what? What's our vaccination rate at right now? Um, is it just over fifty? Just look at look at one shot because I assume if you've had one shot, you're they're probably going to get another, right? So that that would exclude the people who are truly hesitant, right? So right now, fifty four percent are fully vaccinated. <laughs> I don't know how to find out who's just had one shot. I know you can look at dosages given. Yeah, but so I, the three hundred and seventy seven um, so like, doses given. Okay, so that what does that come out to like 56%, 57%? I mean, um, although so, this let's go 18 and over. I've heard it's 75% for 18 and over, which is decent. That's true because kids can't get it, so that's that's like mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, so I think it's a decent rate. Um, you know, one thing is well, I, that rate should be like 95%. 70, so, I don't think 75 <laughs> is a decent rate, but go ahead. So there are people who aren't going to get it like for actual medical reasons though right and and even wait, like though who? wait i want to i want to so when we I, have these conversations a lot of people say like one or two things and they let it slide i really want to go into these like reasons because okay. i think these are total bullshit. okay so the first one was the whole like the worker not wanting to miss one day of work i wholesale reject that reason because like if you're gonna miss if you're gonna miss work because of one day of like feeling crummy on the vaccine if you get sick you're missing a whole week well I, but i just point, told you they're just there i'm not saying that's my argument but that's their justification uh-huh. i mean for me i'm a single mom with fucking three jobs so not only like i don't have two days off i have two days taking care of a kid and so there's a lot of people out there like that. So you're you're not you're not giving the full perspective, and I think that's a little disingenuous because people yeah, don't again, have time like, to take two days being sick. Th- but it's not guaranteed two days being sick. It's more like one day being sick, and even that's not a guarantee. But, but it's if a you chance. don't have time to, it I, is a chance. But you if you scoff don't have time at the eighty percent, you scoff at the eighty percent rate of people with side effects. But like if you look at the CDC at the CDC's website, that's literally then that's not severe right but like there's something like 60 percent of people end up with a severe headache you know 80 percent of people have fatigue so it is pretty high compared to most other pharmaceuticals sure but if you're having that reaction to the vaccine the actual disease itself is going to be like 10 times worse uh, so if you don't have time to take one day of feeling crummy, and by the way, that's a day where you're not shedding the virus as well, which is good. Um, how, what are you, what's going to happen if you get sick for a week? Your life is going to be like ruined. I think that would be a good way to persuade some of these people who are hesitant, but I don't necessarily know that they're going to buy that if they live in a place with low, uh, you know, uh, infection rates. But I don't know if those places exist in the U.S. That's the problem. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm pr- I, I, earlier they do. I do the oh, yeah. Number. I mean, I live sure in Texas, had, and they I, I'm, definitely I'm pretty exist. sure we've had, I'm pretty sure over 20% of people in the U.S. have been infected with the coronavirus at this point. Like, I, I feel like the cases are probably near 100 million. Or at the very least, they're probably like 60, 70, 80 million out of 330 million people. Um like, I think that there have been a, de- a huge percentage of the population, or a huge percentage, like probably like 20% of people have been infected so far, mm-hmm. at least, if not 25 mm-hmm. or 30%. And like, it's only continuing to go around. We've I mean, only got, but like, what are you basing that off around. of? Well, so the coronavirus, well, the cases right now that mm-hmm. are reported in the U.S. are about 41 million. So that's 100% verified cases. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I think I've seen, I think the CDC estimate might be as high as one 
50. I think mm-hmm. I'd have to go and look at that. But like, if you go and you look at like the infection rates in the beginning of the coronavirus, like, I mean, you know that those aren't real, mm-hmm. right? Back when Trump was saying we had 16 cases today, we didn't have 16 cases. We had thousands or tens of thousands. Um, so like, I think a rough estimate, I, I think um, pr- probably 80 million is fair, I would guess. So- we can go and look at like estimates uh, that are like doc- are, are like studied, but I'm mm-hmm. pretty sure that those are sometimes in excess of like 100 million, but yeah. Right, well, I mean, you could also argue, I mean, I agree that the data is bad. I agree the data is bad all around. So, you know, like the death rates, for example, we know that they were conflating other causes of death with COVID deaths. Like that's been confirmed because, I mean, I live in Texas and they admitted it. Absolutely not true. Yes. What what do you mean by that? What do you mean by confirmed? They admitted it. So they said that they were doing that because they wanted more federal aid. But it was all over the news. A lot of a lot of places were doing that. Counties and hospitals, they were they wanted more federal aid. So they were saying, oh, if they died from any reason, here's and Mm -hmm. they had covid, then they died from covid. So here's how those stories went. And if you have a different story, I would love to see it. My understanding is that I don't know if it was it was some very far right, like the federalism. somebody broke some story saying that hospitals get federal kickbacks if they code people as dying of the coronavirus. No, that's not that's what I'm all talking that's about. A, okay, if you have like a, a source of something related to that, I would be really curious to see that because I feel like a lot of vaccine misinformation and this is one of those like nasty rumors that goes around where like, oh, people are, the death rate is actually wildly inflated and I haven't seen I, any concrete I didn't say wildly. I didn't say wildly well, to be well, fair. You're implying, what, what, what do you think the death, like the inflated rate is? Um, okay, so here's a, an AAMC article. Um, mm-hmm. How are COVID-19 deaths counted? It's complicated. Uh, mm-hmm. As the U.S. death toll nears half a million, confusion continues over whether people die of COVID-19 or with COVID-19. And it's an article talking about what's behind the numbers here. So now Yeah, wait, can you, li- can you like me that? Yeah. And then we can, just, we can actually just go through it, so. Mm-hmm. Um, it just says that it's complicated. I haven't actually read this article, but it's the first one that came up when I Googled it. So I, sure. I'm basing this on a couple of things. Okay, so um, real anecdotes from people who I've talked to who've had loved ones die and have them counted as COVID on the death certificate, which is, you know, a, I mean, honestly, unless all those people are lying, which I don't know what, what their incentive would be to do that. Um, and then the other thing is like, this was a big news story, even locally in Texas, where, you know, the, the hospitals had actually admitted to doing that and county health officials had admitted to doing that because they were wanting more aid from the federal government. Yeah, but I, I, I've, I've heard of that charge. But I've never seen that, like, actually. I've heard the charge and I've seen and I've heard the stories from people's mouths saying, yo, what the fuck? My aunt didn't die of COVID. Why is this shit on the, the death certificate? Right. She had she terminal cancer. With, wait, wait. Did she, <laughs> you know? did she die with COVID? Yeah. So it would, I, as far as I know. So now there are people who are like every death was being counted and that's probably not true. But even the CDC has responded to this by providing data on what's called excess death rates. I don't know if you've seen that. So excess death rates means that instead of counting the number of actual COVID deaths as reported by hospitals, which as you know, probably make, not, not even, they probably make tons of mistakes too, right? Because you're talking about hundreds of thousands of millions of hospitals trying to provide data to the federal government. That's gonna be a shit show any way you cut it. So the CDC has responded by providing an excess death rate chart that shows like what, how many people would be expected to die in any given month versus how many mm-hmm. people actually died in any given month to see the Delta. Um, and, you know, and interestingly, I mean, it does still show like a similar number of deaths counted. So I did see that today and I thought that was interesting. I need to pour into those numbers a little bit more, but. Okay. I, I, I would encourage you to do so. I like, I'm skimming this article and I'm pretty sure this article supports everything that I was saying. 100%. Um, there was a really common like rumor early on that like, Oh my God, like, uh, George Floyd, that was a COVID death. Uh, somebody got hit by a car, that was a COVID death. Oh, they had terminal cancer, that was a COVID death. I've never seen that charge substantiated ever. I think the deaths right now from every like official or like studied thing that I've ever seen. And um, actually even this article that you linked me um, the, itself actually uh, says the same thing, that if anything, it's probably undercounted right now. That we probably have too low a number of people that have died um, rather I'm than like, oh, it's like- that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll read it. I will. I mean, you know, and and this is just, this is something that I'm not like telling you like, absolutely this a hundred percent happened, but this is definitely something that people that has come up and that people are claiming. Right. So I think it's worth investigating whether that could possibly be true. Um, Yeah. And I I agree with that. But my problem is that 
we have this unbelievable, unimaginable level of skepticism that's applied to everything around this vaccine, despite the yes. fact that we also, on the other end, have an unimaginable level of data for a vaccine. This is probably, uh, no, I'm sorry, I almost just lied. This is definitely the like most issued vaccine in the history oh, yeah, of all sure. of humankind vaccines. We have more data on this vaccine than any other ever. And overwhelmingly, the data is positive, more so than in the history of any other I, vaccine. Okay, let me, so, like, let me just like, let me just like reiterate that I uh -huh. am not against the vaccine. In fact, sure. I think it's amazing that they all came together and like got it out so fast, like props mm -hmm. to the scientists who got that shit out so fast. Honestly, this was like a remarkable feat of science. So like, I don't want to, I don't like, just because I'm taking a contrarian stance here, I don't want you to think mm -hmm. that I'm against vaccines. I'm definitely not. My stance, my position is more trying to take a charitable approach and understand why people are vaccine hesitant and figure out better ways to address that while also allowing them their space, right? Because one thing we don't need is to be just, you know, these people who are t definitely afraid of the vaccine, demonizing them, telling them, you know, that, you know, you wish they were dead and fuck you, you anti-vax scum, you idiots. Like, this isn't productive. There's good reasons why people are hesitant to take a vaccine. And I think that it's better to be charitable to them and try to understand where they're coming from. Now, I would agree that the information, the misinformation from the right has been absurd. I mean, the information from specifically the right has been absurd. I mean, like these politicians are not doing themselves any favor. They have taken this and they politicized it and they've tried to make it into a, you know, a bipartisan issue and because that's what they're great at. They're great at doing that. And so um, I, I real quick, I agree with you about allowing people to have their space and having those discussions. But part of having those discussions is engaging in like the most fact based discussion possible. Um, like. So, th th so this is kind of what I try to push back on when I talk to people, because like, for instance, like this idea that like, well, you might be sick for one day. That's not a good reason not to get vaccinated. There is no space for that. That's like, that's like if somebody brings up that excuse, that's what you push back on. You're like, okay, well, hold on. Like, is it really that bad to be like I agree pretty crummy with you. for one day? So number one, no, well, but you gave that reason in the beginning for a legitimate reason why somebody might not want yeah, to. Yeah, I think um, it is a legitimate reason, is, but I also think that's a good way to well, push back. Okay, sure. Well, I don't think it's legitimate reason, but number two, um, allow, so um, when we talk about like the coronavirus and how many deaths there are, like opening with stuff like, well, you know, these deaths are inflated because doctors are lying about people dying. Like this is placed right into conspiracy theorists' hands. Like there's no reason to make those concessions. Those aren't valid thoughts because there's, there's like no documentation of this. I like, mean, the documentation is I... the, the news stories that were coming out in the hospitals who were speaking out about it. Now you could say, oh, that was a lie. That was misleading information from the media. You could definitely say that, but that, that definitely was a big news story last year. And it was all I mean, over I know the that place. there were people that wanted it to be a big news story, but like, like my issue is that in terms of how we treat misinformation from different sources, one is like ultimately skeptical and the other is like, oh, we embrace it. So for instance, a doctor came out recently and he said that um, uh, there was an ICU that had gunshot patients that couldn't get in. And that was, uh, it was a lie. Was of, it was. But people were in unbelievably like, where does this doctor work? What happened with this? Like, did right. he actually know that information? Props hey, on them for fact checking it. But one doctor comes out and he says, in our hospital, uh, I'm anonymous, by the way, in our hospital, we code patients as dying COVID-19, even if they don't, so we get free money. Now he was like, oh, 100% true. No fact checking, no background checking. Nobody's dug into any hospital financials. No, like FDA has like charged anybody. There's been nothing from the DOJ, like investigating any of this. Like, why do we just believe that? Okay. Without like any questioning. But when it comes out on the other side, it's like, well, hold on. Now we need to really dig into this doctor, right? It seems like there's a selective skepticism that's applied that is always trying to favor the ultimately skeptical position related to anything having to do with the coronavirus and vaccines. I wouldn't say that it's like, uh, you know, unequally applied. I think that both sides cherry pick data to support their stance. I think that that's just natural. But, you know, the idea that, you know, kind of what you're saying is that we can't believe anything that we hear on the news. Which is I kind mean, of like a weak of point. You can believe on the news. You just have to like be able to like just read through an article fully or something. <laughs> well, like, most the, of what the, the news reports is, is factually true. Sometimes they fuck up one hundred percent. Yeah, but generally I agree. Just, most of what gets reported. Now that doesn't but, include like what pundits are saying or like if you're watching like an enter news entertainment show or whatever entertainment show that's going to be different. But yeah, I mean, but but also you know I think that it's a good thing that that got called out right away by fact checkers. 
and that it made yeah, but there good is news. A, again there is a selective skepticism I, I i feel heavily there is a selective skepticism that's why all these same people that will be so diligent in drilling into the background of this doctor are rushing to stores to buy uh you know like horse ivermectin in order to consume because they think that it's going to give them some protection like the, the, the selective skepticism don't, is just, don't get it just me started me. on ivermectin i I don't, I mean, it, that whole argument that like, they won't take a drug from the FDA because they don't trust the FDA, but they're going to take horse medicine is just laughable. And I think, again, I, I would like to say that I tend to believe that um, the media likes to also cherry pick stories that are that represent the most extremes of society and, and make blow it up and make it seem like everyone is doing it. When in fact, there might have only been a, f you know, like a few people doing that and like, you know, because I, I don't think the most, I hope that most people aren't that stupid. But it's the same thing with the hydroxychloroquine whenever somebody drank aquarium cleaner and one person did that and like it's all over the news now. People are drinking aquarium cleaner and like it's, you know, just this one fringe case that they somehow sure. blew and up I, and, and made it seem like it's very that, common. But I want to be very careful here. I'm not trying to make those extreme claims i'm just going to make the ones that i can support so for instance like <laughs> we can pretend that it's just a few people doing ivermectin but it's not ivermectin is i'm pretty sure on the fd if you go to fda.gov and you look under the uh, animal veterinarian mm -hmm. um products for drug shortages ivermectin is sh there is a shortage on ivermectin but right it's now. probably because they didn't make it. very much of that to begin with and the people stockpiled it because sure. they thought they could sell it to idiots too it's not like everybody who bought it was like going to take it right Okay, but the same thing happened with hydroxychloroquine as well, where there were people that had lupus that couldn't buy the drug at pharmacies because other people were trying to get these. Oh yeah, that's terrible. For yeah, yeah, for sure. So I know a lot about drug shortages and stuff like that. Okay, so gotcha. What, so I, yeah, I what, what were the other like? What oh, the, or, yeah, go for it. Sorry, I keep it ordering. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about like, okay, so we've talked about, you know, you don't think that it's a good excuse for people who just like genuinely don't want to get the vaccine because of side effects. I was throwing that out there because I, I do think that there is a higher number of like a higher prevalence of side effects here than from like almost any other drug. I mean, like the only other drugs you see, like, you know, 80% of people reporting something like fatigue is generally like a cancer drug, right? So I, I think that that's scaring people. And I think that that's not, it's not, it doesn't make them idiots. It just makes them be like, well, looking around, there's not a lot of cases in my area. Why should I take something that's 80% likely to, to make me not feel good versus like, you know, a five to 10% chance of getting sick. So that, that was the first argument. I think that that's okay, probably sure. the weaker clear, one I just, that I have. I just have to yeah, and I'm sorry, just because I'm so big on vaccine misinformation, okay? <laughs> Side effects for vaccines are incredibly common. And for anybody that has ever taken a flu shot, they will tell you this exactly. I mean, Anytime, for arm pain. And I've heard this. I've heard this. At, no, that is not true. Flu vaccines can give you, like, you can feel a little nauseous. You can have a headache. You might want to stay home or whatever. That's right? true. That so, happened to me. No, yeah. So yeah. So number one, every time you go to the hospital, you get a vaccination. You hear this, and I and I have gotten vaccination. And I hear the same speech every time. You might feel a little bit crummy for the day, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So th that one day thing, okay, is that isn't unique to this vaccine. Okay. Yeah. That is, so, well, and then I mean, also we can that just pull that, up the data on that, but sure. Okay. We, sure. We you can okay. look at that if you yeah. want. So like, yeah. So mild local reactions, ten to sixty-four per one hundred. So up to sixty-four percent for like sight, like pain. Uh huh. Um, yeah. So severe is okay, like generalized reactions, um, like fever and fatigue, you have 12 per 100 and lowers to five per 100 for adults. That was for kids. Runny nose, nasal congestion, 59 uh, to 28 per 100. Uh, fever, 16 to 31 per 100. So, you know, it is still kind of up there, but the, the COVID vaccines are higher than that. But yeah, you know. they, they might be slightly higher. Sure. I'm just saying that, like, there are side effects to every vaccine. And you, yes. you cited that 80% number earlier. I don't think that 80% of people are having, like, horrible, like, side effects that they can't go into work or whatever. I don't think so either. And, sure. Okay. And then also, I'm not going to speak for you because I don't know you or your body. Okay. But as somebody that has dated women or whatever, okay, a lot of women have, like, a literal one to two day a month where they don't want to get out of bed because their period, their, like, PMS cramping is really, really, oh, really fucking Oh, Destiny, bad. no. Uh-uh. No, no. Don't uh, use the period yeah, excuse. So, Come no, on. You, uh, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> stop. Excuse me. That is absolutely true. Okay. My ex-wife was one of those that when it's she had her period, she was in... 
That's I, that's why I said I'm not speaking for you, and I've known women where that's not the case. But I'm saying that there are women who have very intense periods, and their PMS cramping is like I have to call out from work today. Okay, oh so my I'm just god. saying like this. Like I don't know why you're saying. Oh my god, um, <laughs> this is okay. Okay, I, okay so right. as, yeah, that's very 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 strange to me. This is a pretty well known thing among a lot of women that you can have really intense periods. It's one of the reasons why um, some women, for instance, take like uh, oral contraceptives is because the birth control can like help to regulate their periods and whatnot. Um, but there are absolutely women that like once a month like can't even go into work because it's that fucked. I'm just saying that like this idea okay. that like the one time thing. I'm sorry, I'm pushing against this really hard, but we can go to the next topic too. Yeah, that like, yeah. oh my god, for one day I might have like kind of a bad headache. Like, uh, I'm not, I'm not feeling that one. There are so many other things going on in society. I don't know about that one, but go ahead to the next one. Well, earlier you had kind of pushed back on like, what are some of these medical examples that people have? So I wanted to get into that um, and yeah, talk no again about like, okay, so this is my personal experience. And like, I just want to get into like, again, a more charitable discussion of understanding why people, you know, need their space and why vaccine mandates and forcing people to do things that they're extremely uncomfortable with for, you know, various reasons is bad. That's the bottom mm -hmm. line. That's what we're discussing now. So I wanted to like kind of relate that to yeah, like sure. what we're talking about. So, uh -huh. um, you know, for me personally, I so I don't know if you know this, I've talked about it a lot, but I ended up getting a blood clot earlier this year in my arm in my armpit that was like life threatening and very rare, right? Um, and okay. at the time the vaccine had just come out and my doctors were like, yeah, maybe just don't get that right now. You're in like an acute illness and like, there's just a lot of unknowns. Don't do it. So I was actually advised by my doctors not to get vaccinated back at the beginning until like I was on blood thinners for a while and it had absolved itself. And immediately online, I was accused of lying, right? Like, and I'm sure that some people do lie or at least exaggerate what their medical conditions are. But I was like, honestly, not lying. I had like, who, like Maddie Cakes on Twitter telling me that I was lying. And it got so bad that I finally just released my medical records to Twitter, which I definitely shouldn't have had to do. But, um, you know, so that's an example of a case where we just don't know how people with certain conditions are going to react. And... I'm gonna take a very charitable approach and speak to like what I was feeling at the time. What I was feeling was a lot of hesitancy because I was already in, like honestly, when you have something like that, it's like, it's traumatic, right? Like it's honestly a bit traumatic to be having these kinds of um, health concerns when you're young and healthy, you don't know what's gonna happen, you've been in and out of hospitals for like months and things are really scary to you. The last thing that I wanted to do was take, at the time was an experimental vaccine and chance having some kind of side effect or something like that. Now, at this point, my doctor no longer recommends that I not get the vaccine. She recommends I get it now because I've, you know, the blood clot is gone and all of that. Um, well. Another thing, another secondary thing to that too is because my under, I'm sorry, I need to be more firm. The mRNA vaccines are not at all right now linked to blood clotting issues, but the coronavirus is. No, no, no. So, so this wasn't an issue of me being scared of getting a blood clot. This was more uh -huh. an issue of me already having one and like knowing that it could just dislodge and kill me at any point was terrifying. It was very scary. Sure. So like okay. it, it's it's less about like so try to try to like disconnect the idea of the blood clot from the J and J blood clot. Okay. First of all, because the J and J blood clot, in case anybody doesn't know, is a very rare form of brain blood clot. So and it's specific to the J and J. So a lot of people are like, you know, when I told people I had a blood clot. The first thing everyone said was, oh my God, you get the vaccine? And I'm like, no, this is not the same blood clot. That is a an acute life-threatening blood clot that's linked only to J&J. &J. So just in case people in my chat didn't know that, right? So I, I'm not one of these people that thinks the vaccine causes blood clots. That's not what I'm saying. So separate what I had and try to understand what it's like for somebody with an acute life-threatening illness who's going through something relatively traumatic and then asking and mandating them to get this vaccine. Let's say they have cancer or something, you know? So you might say, well, your doctor would recommend you not get it in that case, but that's not true. So doctors are recommending that everyone get vaccinated. In fact, my doctor said she doesn't know of a single case where a doctor had recommended against the vaccine in anyone at this point, now that it's FDA approved. Okay, sure. So these medical exemptions no longer are really valid at all, like according to doctors. Sure. I mean, I would agree, yeah. 
But from the patient's perspective, something like that can be very scary. And that's a big source of hesitancy. And I don't think it's right to ask somebody who's going through cancer treatment, who has a life-threatening illness or something like that, to force them to get a vaccine that they don't really know what the side effects are going to be. Because I think that that just totally adds the stress and anxiety that. that they're dealing with. But I mean, that's a big de that's a big part of going through cancer is like the treatment and maintaining your safety and everything, right? Like. Why would you want to be going through chemotherapy and then also get like I'm not going like to speak for them. You okay, know, I will then and I and I will say that, okay? I just think um, I just think somebody... that it's worth noting that some people are hesitant because they're genuinely afraid that it's going to exacerbate their symptoms. Sure, but then it should be like so my kid's mom had stage 4 non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So I've been there through the mm -hmm. whole chemotherapy process, through going to the hospital, through the mm -hmm. hair falling out and the being sick. Like I've mm -hmm. seen that process, right? Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of things about that that can be scary. But like the idea that the coronavirus vaccine is the scary part when, when you're doing chemotherapy like once or twice a week. I, I mean, you, our responsibility as like public messengers should be, you know, to disseminate information that I think is the word, that, that like mm -hmm. is what is the most like likely thing to happen. Right. Or, or what should people be afraid of? And I think you should be far more afraid of actually getting sick than getting like an mRNA vaccine. And I think that you can advise right now, people. Are it. Like, I think you can definitely advise people of that. And doctors are doing that. And I don't object to that. Uh -huh. Uh, what I object sure. to is mandating them to get it. I think that for me, and, and also this this has probably changed for me since the FDA approval and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, also keep in mind that there's, like we talked about, an incredible amount of misinformation going around. There's a, a lot of fear mongering going around, particularly from the right um, and it's a very stressful time for everybody. You know what I mean? So I think that uh -huh. you're right. We should be working to educate people. Um, I think that that is the path to go, educating people rather than, um, you know, saying, if you don't get the vaccine, you're a fucking asshole. Fuck you. You know, I think that uh -huh. that's the wrong approach, especially for somebody I in agree, a tenuous situation. Yeah, and I agree, and I don't do that, and I and I'm not doing that here. But I just want to be super ultra clear on like the, the misinformation or the information that exists out there. I'm gonna agree with you on almost all of that. Okay, so I've done a lot of the research, and I've I I agree that the vaccine seems relatively safe, um, and you know I tried to tell my like I deserve some credit, Stephen, for trying for for telling my chat. Like, I dispel so many conspiracies. Like, as you know, like, a lot of my viewers are more conservative. Um, I, mm -hmm. I do a lot. I've spent a lot of time dispelling conspiracies on my stream and trying to convince people that, you know, this is a conspiracy. It's not true. Here's why. Let's go through the science. Let's figure out why this is wrong. Um, mm -hmm. so, like, and I've done a lot of this, right? So I, I'm not against vaccines. I'm not against the coronavirus vaccine. I am against federal vaccine mandates and even state level vaccine mandates. As far as private companies go, I'm a little bit more like I want to err on the side of, OK, private companies should be able to do what they want. But I think that they're also going to face consequences from that. And I think that's good. I think that, you know, the employee should have the right to, for example, file un unlawful termination lawsuits. Right. And like so the market's going to regulate it. I, I don't want to force companies to force people to get vaccinated. I want them to make that business like, decision. How do you feel about schools doing it? So it's honestly not very much we're talking about schools at this point because schools, like for children, children are treated differently by the FDA. So like you would not be able to mandate vaccines to kids until you had years of data. And that's unless they made some kind of regulatory change, because that's been the case with all vaccines. So the vaccines that kids are mandated to get now have been around for decades. Right. Would you agree? Um, and most of them aren't I required to get the flu shot. The case, yeah. Sure. So but like I know that there are some states that are or at least in L.A., they've started like mandating in schools for some children to get um, vaccinated for eligible students. Mm -hmm. uh, like, are you are you OK with that? Oh, you're, you're talking about colleges. Um, so I, it might be high school. So I think in LA, I think it was students who are 12 and older. So for, for most, I don't know about for older kids, but for younger kids, it's definitely not going to be soon that they do that. I don't think that they're going to do it soon for any kids, honestly, because I think there'll be way too much pushback. Now for when you're getting to higher learning institutions like colleges, it then becomes a little more testy because they're private organizations. Some of them are public, but like you're not forced to go there, right? So it's not, you get, you get off on the clause of, well, you choose to go here. Whereas with schools like high schools and elementary schools, 
that would be a legitimately forced vaccine because they would have no choice other than to get vaccinated or not go to school, which is illegal to not let your kid go to school, right? Okay. So, um, yeah, so for private companies, like, here's how I feel about healthcare workers, and I'll get some pushback from my chat on this a lot. Um, if you're a healthcare worker, if you're a nurse, if you're a doctor, it feels like you should have already known that it was possible that you would have to get certain vaccinations, right? To me, it seems like if you went through all that nursing school, you would probably be expecting something like this to happen. I mean, there's a lot of already hospitals that require flu shots. There's actually, I think there's only like a few states that have like state requirements, but um, you know, this is like a pretty common thing. So I think nurses and, and stuff, uh, I think they should be given now that the FDA approval is complete, I think that it it's probably not going to be very defensible in court. Because when you look at like court cases, for, for example, like uh, wrongful termination, what they're looking for is, did you fire this person because of like, you know, a religious or even some sometimes in some states philosophical objection to something? Um, and can the employee prove that? And then also the only defense that the company has in that case is to say they they were safety concern. So that's not going to be a very good defense for, for example, a construction site, right? Like you're not like going to endanger everybody by one person not being vaccinated. But at a hospital, you could make the defense or the claim in court that they were make, you know, posing a safety risk to patients. So I think that it's going to be really hard for nurses and healthcare workers to bring up effective lawsuits. But I do think that other companies will be able, or other employees and in other industries will be able to bring up lawsuits in this case. And I think it's going to deter some companies from mandating vaccines. Huh? Do you agree with that? Um, or? I, I mean, I, I assume what you're saying is true. I don't know 100%. I don't know how that'll play out or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So I think that, okay, so let's move on. Because like, I think we, we, we've been like kind of bouncing around the subject. But I think that the biggest argument that I have, um, that I, and again, this stems from my experience with the FDA and pharmaceutical companies. I think that the biggest issue with any kind of federal or statewide mandate is a conflict of interest it poses in the precedent it sets saying that the government can force you to take something that a pharmaceutical company developed and is making billions of dollars off of. I think that to me, that's, that's the concern that I have. I, I've talked a lot about being charitable and understanding why people are vaccine hesitant and trying to understand their perspective and be kind and trying to educate them instead of, you know, admonishing them. But I think ultimately why I'm opposed to federal vaccine mandates is that reason, the conflict of interest. I mean, like, if they were publicly developed, would you be in favor of that? I think, well, so we could talk about that. that. That's a completely different topic, but we could talk about like well, pharmaceutical just, I, profits. I don't, I, and... Like, I don't see there to be, there's no, I don't think there's a conflict of interest there at all. Um, the conflict of anything, interest I think arises... the incentives, I think, are, are, are super lined up really well. That if we have a public verification process, the FDA, mm -hmm. and a private pharmaceutical desperately wants to sell a drug mm -hmm. to the U.S. people, then their goal should be to meet or exceed all of the expectations set publicly by the FDA. Oh, I would consider those cute. to be like aligned incentives. Do what, you, what you, okay, let me, that? let me, yeah, let me, before I continue, let me establish kind of a baseline of like how you feel about this. But like, do you agree or disagree that the FDA is often incentivized to approve drugs by big pharma? Um, I, I don't think I agree with that, no. I do. And I left the industry because of this. <laughs> so uh, I'm, and I, you know, I talked about this last night on my stream, but I'm actually, you know, there's, if you just do some research, I can give you some examples of, of issues when this has happened. For example, if you've ever heard of um, Resilin, Resilin was a diabetes drug where the FDA took three years to remove it from, uh, to withdraw it from approval. And the reason that they did it wasn't because people weren't dying and they didn't know. They knew people were dying. There were political reasons they weren't withdrawing it. And also they were in the pocket of Warner Lambert, which was later turned into Pfizer. So they were basically being paid off and getting kickbacks from pharmaceutical companies. And this is just one example. I mean, this has been proven time and time again. This happens oh, literally I, all the I time. Like Based on the article you linked me earlier, I would have to do more research on this because I don't think that I, I, I this might be true for one or two drugs. Um, 
but I know that the FDA process is an incredibly stringent process at times, especially in the early 2000s. It was harder to get drugs approved. I know in the US for the FDA um, versus Europe, I think they've tried to alleviate that process a little bit. I want to say in the early 2000s, it was like 25 drugs a year would get approved in the US. Mm -hmm. It was an incredibly arduous process. So and I think that number has gone up to like 30 or 40 now. Um, yeah, but like almost any argument that you're going to give me about like, oh, like it's all rigged and oh, the kid. No, 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 I, just, I don't really think answer. it's all rigged. Well, yeah, well, to be clear, that's that is exactly what you're saying. That is, <laughs> no, no, no. I, you might not. Yeah, no, no, no. Yes, yes, yes. You might under, not understand that that's what you're saying, but that's exactly okay. what you're telling me. Let me you're clarify. You're telling me that then. the incentives are. No, no, wait. You don't have to clarify. Okay. okay. You're telling me that the incentives are misaligned and that it might be possible that big pharma could buy out the FDA to pass bullshit drugs. Is that not what you're saying right now or? Not bullshit drugs, but drugs that are that they know are where the benefits, the risks outweigh the benefits, but they continue to market it because they're in the pocket Wait, so what, of what do you call, that's a, that's that you just said bullshit drug in a fancy way. That's exactly what you're saying. That's bullshit okay. drugs. Well, Dr yeah. So if you're going to drug isn't like, a technical term, so sorry. Sure. But if you're going <laughs> to tell me that the entire FDA is potentially rigged or whatever, I, then my next question is going to be, okay, well, then who do you appeal to to figure out what drugs should be passed or not? Okay. Well, you want to go to Europe you, because no, no, no. I can find examples of drugs that were passed in Europe that was a, uh, the, the thermaldehyde or whatever, mm -hmm. or that was like causing women's babies to be born with like seven arms or whatever. I mean, like okay. we can find examples of like the little big, bite. like, yeah. Okay. Little, I have yeah. a lot. I have, you said a lot of things. So, and, and I think that I can clarify a couple of them. So first of all, let's talk about, you know, you're saying that the FDA has a very stringent process. That's true. Mm -hmm. But ultimately the reason that we don't approve as many drugs as Europe has to do with the fact that we have a lot more red tape here and we're underfunded as opposed to Europe. And it's just generally we're more inefficient than Europe. The EU, it's not, they're not approving more drugs because they don't care about patient safety and they're not using science. The way that they use science is different, but it's also they're more efficient and they're more heavily funded and they have more resources. So the EU tends to be more efficient than the FDA. So that that's the reason why, you know, you can't say the EU is terrible at proving drugs and the FDA is really good at it. I'm not saying the FDA is bad at it, but we're just less efficient than the EU. So that's the first thing that I would say about that. Um, sure, I guess what I would look at is like, are the studies there for what's being approved? And if the research seems to be there, and it meets or exceeds the FDA approval process, that's mm -hmm. something that I would feel pretty good about. I wouldn't mm -hmm. appeal to like, well, FDA is actually in the pocket of big pharma and now we have like misaligned incentives. Okay, so like, the other thing is, I don't think that the FDA is inherently bad. I think that there is opportunity for corruption there. And if you disagree with that, I don't know. I don't know how I can like, I mean, there's well, like, obviously what, what, opportunity like, for corruption there, right? Would you agree? What, what, shh. Well, I mean, like that's like an it's a yeah. meaningless statement because there's oppor there's opportunity for corruption in every single thing. Yes, all the that's time, true. Right? Yeah. So that statement doesn't really mean anything. So then the question is like, what is your proposed alternative model for, like, what what would you say instead of the FDA? Like, I no no I safety? I think that you're misunderstanding me. So you you talked about thalidomide earlier. So thalidomide people use this argument as like, oh, the FDA has released dangerous drugs, and that's wrong, and that's a myth. And here the reason is because when the thalidomide tragedy happened, that's actually how the FDA, as we know it today, was born. They were born out of the thalidomide. So at the time when that happened, uh, a lot of a lot of anti-vaxxers use this argument. So I'm really just giving you some like fuel to the fire here, okay? But during the thalidomide uh, tragedy, the FDA actually started to require safety and efficacy for the first time. So FDA, as we know it today, was really born from the thalidomide tragedy. It wasn't like the FDA screwed that up, like some people like to claim. Um, the FDA is extremely important. If we didn't have the FDA, we would not have, we would still be taking tonics like they took back in the 1800s with like opium in it for like a headache, right? The FDA is extremely important. So I'm not suggesting that, oh, the FDA is bad, we should ab abolish it or anything like that. All I'm doing is asking you to acknowledge that there is corruption that goes on. There are pharmaceutical kickbacks, there are bribes, and these things have been proven time and time again. And the reason that it's dangerous to allow the federal government to mandate something like a vaccine is because of the potential for corruption. And I'm not even just speaking about the vaccine. I'm really speaking philosophically as a whole. I don't think it's right for the government to mandate anyone take any kind of medication. And that's why I think that this is a bad precedent to set. Then do you, do you believe that all of private medicine should be abolished in favor of public systems? Absolutely not. Wait, because so you're not being forced to take any of that. 
You know okay, the side maybe, effects. Wait, you might not be because you're a healthy person, but let's look at people that have type 1 or type 2 diabetes. They are essentially forced to take insulin. Is it unethical that we have private companies that develop insulin? Because there's a misalignment in incentives. They know that you're going to die if you don't take it. So they can. There's a lot wrong with the pharmaceutical company, for sure. There's a lot wrong okay, with wait, pharmaceutical wait, wait, wait. incentives. You're, but you're not, yeah, you're not answering my question, though. I'm asking, like, is it completely and totally unethical that private companies develop medication that might be life saving? Should no. all of that medication. No. Okay, so why is there not a misalignment in incentives there? I'm not talking about a misalignment in incentives. I'm talking about the opportunity for corruption, not, not pharmaceutical incentives. Okay, so. When a drug gets denied, like I sent you a link to the Resolin thing, read it on your own time because it's a long, it's a really interesting long story. I deep dived into it last night on stream. Um, but so what I'm saying is that when a big drug maker knows that they're about to put out a billion dollar drug and they send it to the FDA and the FDA goes, well, I don't know, this doesn't look like a very good idea. They don't just go, oh, well, okay, sorry. I guess then I'll go try to make another drug. No, they go, fuck that. We've already spent $100 million on advertising for this drug, and we're not going down without a fight. So then it becomes a, Wait, a there political are, there issue. There are companies that spend hundreds of millions on advertising a drug before it's gone through phase three trials? Well, I don't know how much, but yeah, they spend a, sh a shit ton of money on drugs. And even after they've gone through phase three clinical trials, even then the FDA has to review the data and make sure that the, the benefits outweigh the risk. I would, I would be really surprised if that was factually okay, true. Well, there are companies okay, that regardless of how much money it is, the point remains that the, the companies, the pharmaceutical companies, they don't go out without a fight, right? So if the FDA doesn't like their drug, they're not going to stop trying. And that's when things get ugly. That's when people get bribed. That's when people start suspiciously losing their jobs for objecting to wanting to pass the drug. I mean, I'm telling you this because it's happened to me. I worked for a small pharmaceutical company that were trying to release a generic version of the Johnson and Johnson drug. Do you agree that generics are very important for pharmaceutical market? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, they're, they're important because they lower costs around the board for everybody and they provide an alternative for patients to take if something happened to the name brand manufacturing site, right? Which is what happened. Um, but anyways, I'm, it's a long story, so I won't go into all the details, but my head, I worked for a small pharmaceutical company that was bankrupted by Johnson and Johnson because they petitioned the FDA that our drug wasn't as good as theirs, like baselessly. And, you know, the pharmaceutical, you know, the FDA was making some decisions that didn't make sense to us at all. It was very suspicious, <laughs> very, very obvious that they were taking the side of Johnson and Johnson without any true scientific data or reasoning to do so. So I've seen it happen myself. I've worked in the industry. Okay, so I've heard the stories. I know more than like most people know about this, like the internal things that go on between pharma and FDA. So then should we not like mandate anything ever? I, I don't understand no. how there's like... <laughs> Okay, so you're against like the mandating of all vaccines in schools? I, I, I believe that there should be exceptions. People should be able to provide exceptions. Yeah, I, I am generally against mandating vaccines. Yeah. Like um, any of them. You know, it's funny because you made the seatbelt argument the other day on Twitter. I'm against mandating seatbelts. Like, honestly, I just don't want, I don't like the government nannying us. I don't want the government telling us like, you need to do this for your safety because you fall down this slippery slope of letting the government determine what you need to stay safe rather it's than giving a, you the right to live your life. Matter. It's not a matter of the problem when it comes to vaccines, it's not a matter of keeping you safe. It's a matter of endangering every other person. Like, How do you, okay, okay, let me, okay, let me push back. I, and, and you can maybe change my mind about this. I, I'd be willing to listen to you, okay? Because I, I, I messaged somebody, feline father, I don't know, know, who, that, Fuck, know, so know who that is, I'm but I messaged so him because I wanted in. him oh to forge some But my question is, how do you really think that you're endangering everyone else's life by not being vaccinated? When number one, being vaccinated, which you are, right, that prevents you from being hospitalized, according to you, like 100% or like very, very close to like 99% less chance of being hospitalized, right? So how does an, un uh -huh. at this point, knowing that, how does an unvaccinated person, a person like, you know, again, we have 60, 70% of the people probably ultimately will be vaccinated. So how does that 30% not being vaccinated risk everybody else's lives? What are you, what, what are you asking me? How does it not, what do you mean by that? 
like how is it how how am how is somebody who's not vaccinated endangering everyone else's life it's pretty simple okay you said that you worked in pharmacy stuff so you understand the concept of like herd immunity right Yes, I do. But they also said that herd immunity would happen at 70%. And then they changed the goalposts and they were like, oh, well, now it's like 80%. And, now, you know, you I don't think that, that herd that immunity is like. 70, hold on, hold on, wait, wait, wait. That's because in the beginning, we didn't have variants that were 2x more like transmissible than they okay. are now, right? So you do so realize the that there are going like to be some people like, that don't yeah. get vaccinated no matter what, right? You acknowledge this. You acknowledge that it's completely yeah. impossible to vaccinate 100% of people. Well, no, there's people who actually do. So there are people who cannot take the vaccine. Vaccine. And those honestly, yeah, this, the only you, people. We, yeah, we appeal. We appeal to that, but this is like less than like two percent of. Yeah, society. I agree. This is very, I agree. It's very no, low. The thirty percent trying to say that like, well, some people can't do it. That is an incredible. It might even be less than one percent of society that actually super can't get vaccinated. That is a very, very low percentage. So I'm not worried about that. Okay, right? Who are you if worried I was sitting about? Here, I'm worried about the 30% of people that are turning into like bioterrorist labs by like propagating the infection over and over and over again, and then also increasing the likelihood of breakthrough infections by being around other Do people you, that are okay, vaccinated, let me ask but you still this like question. shedding okay. the virus like crazy. So yeah. you're talking about mutations, right? Okay, so- No, no, I'm just talking about the normal virus. We can talk about mutations too, but the normal virus itself is that like, if I'm in a room with a ton of vaccinated people, like the chances of me getting infected are pretty low. Mm -hmm. But if 30% of these motherfuckers are unvaccinated and a couple of them are sick, I might still get sick. And then I might pass it on to somebody else, even though I'm vaccinated, right? Like, why would I want 30? That's such a high number. If we were at like 95% vaccinated and I was screaming at you and you're like, well, some people can't do it for medical reasons, I would be way warmer to your argument. We're nowhere no, no. near that level. I, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that there are some people who are not going to get vaccinated, like no matter what you do, even if you mandate it, right? Because we've already talked about, I think that we've already talked about how from a pragmatic standpoint, vaccine mandates are completely impractical. They're never going to happen, right? They're never going to work because how do you enforce it? You already acknowledge that, right? Potentially, yeah, sure. Right. So, um, so I guess like my question really is, I still kind of don't understand because if all the people who wanted to be vaccinated and wanted to be protected from the drug are protected from the drug. I mean, yeah, you might get sick, but you also might get sick with anything else. So the point is, and this has been the argument that, that pro-vax people have been making, is that, well, it prevents you from dying, it prevents you from being hospitalized, and I agree with that, and I think that's great. But if you've been vaccinated and you know that there's like a 99.9% .9 chance that you're not gonna die or be hospitalized, if you get it, it's gonna be more mild because you're vaccinated, then why why do you make the statement that someone being unvaccinated puts everyone in danger? There's two reasons. So one, which has already happened, is because the more mobile bio bioterrorism labs there are that are wandering throughout society- What do you mean mobile the, bioterrorism lab? What is that? As in, if you're somebody that won't get vaccinated and you will willingly take the virus into your body and then try to facilitate the evolution of that virus into something more infectious and How more deadly- How does one so like try to facilitate the evolution of a virus? <laughs> when you don't take the minimum level of risk to protect yourself against something, then you're essentially facilitating that to happen. We would both agree with this for for instance, if we're talking about women being safe, right? You and me would agree that like, you know, you probably shouldn't go out completely alone at night and get wasted with a bunch of strangers and get, okay. you know, raped or killed or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. We would agree with that. And it's the same thing with vaccines. If you don't take the minimum level risk, the minimum level of, of stuff to protect yourself, then it's mm -hmm. like, what the fuck is wrong with you, right? How many so people if you are do you walking... think really aren't doing any of that? For the people that are anti-vaxxers, that, that aren't willing to get like either of the mRNA vaccines, probably over 50%, probably over 70% that okay. aren't willing to wear a mask properly or socially distance or anything like that. It's probably so very, half very, of very the 30% that aren't vaccinated are, as you say, like- Pro Probably far more would be my guess. Acting like 70, 80%. Spreaders. Probably, yeah. Right. But, you know, okay, so like, can we acknowledge that? So I, I heard a lot of people making the argument that like, um, the variants, oh, you know, the people who aren't vaccinated are becoming like uh, basically like incubating variants and that's where all the variants are coming from. When in reality, the variants are coming from like India, South America, places that have very low vaccination rates, right? So, I mean, I've always thought that rather than forcing it on people in America, we really should be focusing like on a more world like approach and trying to get vaccines out to places like India, South South Africa, South America, places like that who don't have like a lot of vaccine, not South Africa, South Wait, America yeah, and Africa. But that's, I understand, but that's exactly my point. So number one, 
places where there are very few vaccinated people are more likely to spread um, or more more likely to cause a like mutation to happen that like thrives and spreads on population. But that can still mm -hmm. happen in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Right. If there's large swaths of unvaccinated people. But there's not large. So so this this goes back to what's called the leapfrog um, like approach to understanding how viruses work. So in India, we have large populations of people who are entirely unvaccinated. So it's much easier for the virus to jump around and mutate than it is in America, where we have like, oh, 30% of people aren't vaccinated, but they're dispersed evenly throughout America, right? So the virus has to jump farther, like a frog jumping from like, you know, lily pad to lily pad, right? Yeah, but in the US, we're almost getting to like a daily case rate of, of as many as we had almost back in the beginning of the year. How do you not see that that's like a problem? I see that that's a problem. The reason I see that is a, a very, the reason that I see that as a very concerning thing is because of how many people are vaccinated. I understand that your argument is that the transmissibility and, or the infection rate of Delta is higher. Um, but also the vaccines aren't as effective against Delta. I think that that's what the data is showing me. So I think but that another- careful, Hold on, hold on, careful. They're not as, they're not as effective as we thought they'd be, but it's still like 50% plus. Uh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, I, I said not as effective. Sure, right? but that's not an argument. That's just like some random shit you said. No, it's not, it's right? absolutely not. It, so it, it, if no, no, you're- it does, Because my, my prescription is that almost every person in society should be vaccinated. You pushing back with, well, you know, people that are vaccinated could still get sick. That's not an argument, right? People who wear seatbelts can still die. Right. That, that doesn't mean anything yeah. that, that has no bearing on the conversation. So, Honestly, yeah, but, there yeah, are still, but you my can still argument, get infected with the Delta variant, but that's an even stronger argument in favor of needing more than the 54 percent that are vaccinated now being vaccinated. That's an even stronger argument that every single person that can get vaccinated should be pushed to do so as much as we possibly can. OK, so, OK, and I'm not disagreeing again. So I think that you're you're kind of for sometimes you're forgetting that I'm not anti-vax and I think that the vaccines are safe and I think that people should get them. I do. Okay. So sure, but you're, first you're of like, all. you're regurgitating like every bad argument I've heard. It's not a bad like, argument what? to say that the, the, the vaccine is less effective against the Delta variant. And that's probably a reason that people are putting it off. Right. Because no. yes, that's another, that's absolutely. I know people. Get it. Why? Why not wait until something better comes it's out? Like, if I'm going to be like totally honest, okay, hold on. I'm trying to be nicer this year, okay? But I'm going to back up and be totally honest. Okay? No, no, be you mean to me. To I fucking, like it. You it's have to be absolutely fucking brain dead to not get vaccinated. And any other part of That's your life, just, okay? I just, I and don't any, believe and, and, that. No, 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 you're wrong. You're just wrong. And That's any your other opinion. part of your life. I can't be wrong about no, your no, no, opinion. No, 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 no. It's not, well, I'm, I'm operating for the assumption that you care about your health and the health of people around you. So if you have some other foundation, then maybe you have a different opinion, okay? I, under, I, only, I concede that, okay? So if you're somebody that your okay. goal is to be like a super spreader, then sure, okay? Okay, but like, yeah, nobody's if you're like doing a, that. If you're, a, if you're a rational individual, so I wanted to travel a lot, and I do, and I, and I like to be around people and stuff. If you want to do that, I didn't get vaccinated because I care about fucking online debates or winning YouTube things or whatever. I did it because I don't want to get fucking sick. So I like when that. I see people bring up these arguments who are like, well, it's actually, we thought originally it was going to be 85% protected, but now we see that the data shows it's actually like 50 to 60% protected. Okay. One, 50 to 60% more protected. It's still really, 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 really good. Okay. In any like video game or in any other part of my life, I would want that protection if it's free, which a vaccine is right. literally, it is free. Right. Number one. And number two, it's still a 90% protection against hospitalization. Why the fuck I, would I not I take that protection? I that is like such an obvious all, no brainer. So, well, so, so, hold on, because you're saying, making a no, disingenuous no, no, argument because I wasn't all, arguing that. Same, I wasn't arguing you are, that. You are saying. No, I was talking about know. variants popping up. And I know, and I'm talking about the variant, but you told me, you told me, you said specifically, well, people are looking at the, the reduced protection against the Delta variant, and that's why they're deciding not to get the vaccine. Okay. That's not an argument to not get the vaccine, that vaccine. That I doesn't do make think any that sense. that's a one reason. I do think that that's it's, one reason people not. are doing that. If, it, if there was a report that came out tomorrow that said that 10 times the number of people that previously thought to have died in car accidents because of seatbelts, for instance, they get into a crash and they get trapped oh, with their seatbelt on and they like that. Seat right? If that... <laughs> because this is the argument. If that argument came out, I'm it's not going to be like, oh, well, equivalence. fuck me. I'm going to stop. It's not a it false equivalence. It is a false equivalence. Because one okay. is a okay. nylon strap and the other is a complex pharmaceutical substance that you inject into your body with side effects. It's not. The, first of all, the side effects are incredibly minimal. There, Secondly, no, stop, not, stop denying that there are side effects. 
You, you know literally deny it to me earlier that women have bad periods. Okay, I so don't. don't talk to me about the nine side don't. effects. Number okay? one. Okay, so Number like two, any side effect that you might have from the vaccine <laughs> is like seven times to ten times worse if you actually get the disease. That's why that side effect argument doesn't make sense to me, especially if you're a frontline worker. If you work in food service, you're like, well, I don't want to get the vaccine because I might have to take one day off. God help you if you get sick because you're fucked. It's not an argument. It's not a real argument. Okay, that that's but you're misinterpreting my argument. Okay, I was I do believe that there are people who feel that way though. I do believe that there are people who are hesitant more because of the effectiveness than like other reasons, right? So they look at. Can you walk me through the logic of that? Like, okay, well, it's gonna get a vaccine. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm gonna get a vaccine. For okay, okay. Yeah. here's here's the logic that goes behind that. Not saying this is my logic. Stop attacking me. Okay. But the, here's okay. the logic that goes behind that. Um, man, my sister got super sick for like three days with the vaccine. Fuck, I don't really want to take it, but I think I'm going to do it anyways. Oh, what? It's only 50% effective? Well, and I'm going to have to get a booster? Why don't I just wait until a better one comes out? I mean, so I, that, that's the that logic. These same people, so you think that for these same people, I'm curious, mm -hmm. if a Delta variant vaccine were to come out, you think they would take that one? Yeah. I mean, some of them, okay. probably not all of them. No, there are people I can see. There are people in the United States and all over the world. This isn't a U.S. problem. This is all over the world. People who are just not going to take it no matter what, just because. There are some people mm -hmm. who are seriously scared, thinking that, you know, people are trying to mass murder the population, which is absurd. But there are people who believe that. There are also people who just say, you know what? Fuck you, government. I don't fucking want to. And that's a big problem because... The hesitancy rates, as you know, I'm sure, are higher among minorities, right? This is this is true. So, um, you know, this to me, all of this like to be clear, I just want to be super clear about that, okay? Hold on, I, I don't know how progressive you think I am. I don't give a fuck about that, okay? <laughs> Black people don't want to get fucking vaccinated, then fuck them. They're dumb as fuck. I don't care about Tuskegee. Okay. I don't care I'm about any not, of that shit. So I'm, I'm not, not to be clear. I'm not making any of those arguments. I'm not gonna okay. make an excuse for minority population not getting vaccinated. I'm not either. They're fucking dumb as fuck, okay? But okay. I'm right, trying to be clear on that. Okay. Okay. okay, I'm trying to be charitable. Okay. Sure. okay, I'm just just, just I'm, to be clear. Here, on that. I'm making a point. Let me make my point. Okay, so okay. the reason that people are putting their foot foot down and saying no, I don't want to, it's not because they're brain dead idiots. Part of it, this is a big part of it, is that it's been politicized. There's been misinformation spreading on both sides. There's been hatred, division, and animosity to both sides. Um, and the reason for that, really, the blame. The blame for where we are right now with all the people thinking that the government's trying to mass murder us is on the government. Because the reason that people, specifically minorities, I was using them as an example, one of the reasons that these people distrust the government is because the government has been fucking distrustful, right? So that's where we yeah, are a as lot a society. Of the, the problem is that how, how distrustful the government is, though, nobody has a realistic assessment of that because it gets played up so much by alternative media. Oh, absolutely. Does the government fuck around and do things? That. Sure. But there has not been enough, like, quote unquote, misinformation from the CDC mm -hmm. to make a reasonable, rational person vaccine hesitant. Not so, even close. Okay, so I'd now, like if to you talk follow about that. Some alternative, if you follow some alternative media outlets, that might be the case, sure. Well, but, I like, think that the CDC yeah. also... I think the CDC misstepped as well. Let me I, let me explain. Like I've been I've been working on this like theory a little bit. Okay, so um, the CDC. I think this is going to sound kind of contrary to what I've been arguing. Like kind of the stances I've been taking. The CDC gave the people too much information straight from the get go. They were trying to talk science to the plebs. And it, that's why things started to get misrepresented. People started misunderstanding the science. People started all of these, spun all these conspiracy theories off of this. Not only that, but the CDC, and I'm not, I'm not going to like attack them for this because science is like people, a lot of people who don't understand science think science is science, it's facts, it's done guys. But that's not true. Science is always changing. Right. And, and part of science is continuously fact checking, continuously peer reviewing, continuously changing your stance based on new information. And that's what the CDC did. They put out some information at the beginning and then that ended up being kind of off and they had to modify it. And so they started putting out more information that was 
contradictory. And that gave a lot of people, especially like alternative media fuel to be like, well, they're just contradicting themselves left and right. They don't know what's going on, which might be true. It's not true that they don't know what's going on. It's more true to say that they're monitoring continuously what's going on and they're updating their assessments and their recommendations based on that in like a scientific way. But the majority of people do not understand science enough to be able to take all of that. So it was very easy to convince them that like the CDC didn't know what they're talking about. They're trying to mislead you. They're putting all of this stuff out there. They don't know what they're talking about. Does that make sense? I agree with you 1 million percent. Okay. So I'm glad. Um, I think that the, yeah, I think that the reason for this is because like there, it's hard because if you don't come out with any information, you kind of basically cede all that ground to everybody else. Mm -hmm. And I, there's probably like a lot of pressure to be like a first mover there. Like, okay, well, if other people are going to do misinformation, we've got to get this information out first. But I do think that that was probably, I don't know if it was a mistake or not, honestly. It's really hard to say because if you don't say something and everybody else says, it kind of makes it look like you're hiding stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I don't know what the right move was there for the CDC. That's a, that's yeah, a it is. It's hard to decide like what was the right move because at the same time, you don't want to just like order people to do this, order people to do that with any without any basis, you know? I think that it would be helpful if more people just understood that the reason the CDC was constantly changing their guidelines was because of new information that they were getting and not because they were intentionally trying to mislead people. So I do, I mean, for, for me, I, I blame the media, I blame the government, I blame the, the two-party politicians. Honestly, I blame Biden a little bit because I don't think that the, the, the path they took to, vac to getting people vaccinated was good. So here, let me explain. Biden came out with a tweet one time that made me cringe so fucking hard. And it was like, look, it's simple. Just either get vaccinated or wear a mask for the rest of your life. The choice is yours. And I don't know what in his brain made him think that like finger wagging and giving the American citizens an ultimatum was the route to go there. So a lot of like their officials had been saying stuff like, we need to make it very difficult for them to live their lives without the vaccine. We, you know, and be people were interpreting that as you're gonna try to take our freedoms away to force us to get the vaccine. And that furthered this sentiment, furthered this divide. I think that it would have been great to understand from the start that the American people are more easily persuaded by like, you know, information and like, hey, make your own decision. We believe that this is safe. We want everybody to be safe. Please get vaccinated. Maybe here's some incentives rather than finger wagging and giving them ultimatums and telling them that they're gonna take their liberties away. And, and at this point, we're already way past that. It's like, at this point, I'm just criticizing the way it was handled. I think it's too late to do anything about that. But that's a huge reason people are hesitant because a lot of people in America and around the world are basically children, right? Like if the more you try to push them to do something, the less they want to do it. And that's also, um, you know, amplified by their distrust of the government in the first place. Um, I mean, I don't disagree that some of the rhetoric has maybe been not that great around vaccinated people, but, um, or, or around the vaccines. Yeah, I don't necessarily disagree with that, but, um, I mean, it is true, <laughs> I guess. Or maybe or maybe we won't be masked forever. Maybe at some point we're just going to say, like, ah, oh, fuck it. You know, like, maybe 5% of the population just dies to the coronavirus because we actually, like, can't conduct ourselves like adults or anything. I mean, maybe that yeah. is, like, what I happens mean, in the future. You but... know, in the future, we might have another pandemic that kills off even more of us. You know, pandemics are natural occurrence. Um, I am really interested to see how this gain-of-function uh, research investigation goes, though. Although I think that we'll never actually know the truth because it'll definitely be hidden from us. Um, but it's definitely interesting to think about that. But pandemics are wait, 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 real quick. What what would that change for anything? I'm curious. Well, it would. Well, it's very important to know where viruses came from when you're studying pandemics and trying to get lessons learned and figuring out why it spread so quickly. I mean, how it originated is incredibly important. Honestly, it's like the most important thing you can learn about the pandemic is how it why originated. Do you say that? Would you agree? No, I don't agree. This I is think virology one hundred and one. Why do you think that? Why do you think that the the first thing that they do when a pandemic breaks out is start looking for the source? because they want to research it. They want to know if this was natural, how did it jump from a bat to an animal? It's very, very important. It's like the most important. Yeah, but like, let's say, let's say that we look through this, like, let's say that it ends up that it did come from like gain of function research uh -huh. in a lab. Theoretically yeah. stuff could evolve like in the wild to do this as well, sure. right? Like, sure. Yeah, obviously. So how, well, if, that's if, usually if what happens. If we, can't, if we can't respond to something right now that came wild from the wild or from the left like why mm -hmm. i don't understand where it's the, not about response it it's about prevention 
But we can't prevent diseases from like no, but we can prevent right? so gain of function research from causing global pandemics. Okay, I I just don't see how that would play into like our response or how that would make like if it if it came out to be like oh my god this was gain of function research like I don't know what that changes in the equation. I well, mean, other it changes than, like, maybe because, we don't do like so, maybe we don't do this type of research. Sure, yeah, that, obviously. I, I don't even know if. The, well, you say obviously. I don't think it's an obvious answer. Number one, but number two, there's still always the case that a pandemic could come from like a natural thing that right for sure. Still but let's let's back to. up to the, the gain of function research. So it wasn't that gain of re function research shouldn't be done ever because it does play an important role in understanding diseases. The gain of function research shouldn't have been conducted at that site in China because there were there were um, they were supposed to not do that because that particular those sites in Wuhan and in China in general were notoriously unsafe so we already had the information that these labs shouldn't be doing gain of function research because we've audited them and we've noticed that they're not safe and there's reasons why they decided they didn't want to do that there so you know the the important thing is understanding that what kind of gain of function research and, and how did it end up getting you know how did they end up infecting a person who left and infected everybody else that's very important it's also important to understand the exact thing they were doing in the lab like what exactly were they doing with the virus so that we can you know understand how this virus came about to help us study other similar viruses that could come about naturally that's what the actual value of gain of function research is but it's really important to know where it came from like in the case yeah, of the I guess I pandemic. just I see this fixation on where it came from but the massive failure here even if it was the case that it was gain of function research but even if it was the case that it was a bioweapon that it was intentionally crafted to do it. Even if that was the case, I still think that the biggest fuck up of all of this has been the worldwide response to it. It, it wasn't even the initial. Oh, the pandemic. worldwide response it, has been terrible. I'd agree. So yeah, so e even if it was the case, it was a bioweapon. And I, but I feel like people fixate on that. Where did it come from? I'm not from? fixating on it. I haven't fixated on it. I just brought it up kind of in the discussion. Okay. I'm not fixated. Sure. I said, I'm very interested to see what the investigation yields. Are you not interested to know where this came from? Do you not care? Almost not, almost not at all. Really? I mean, like it would be interesting, but I, I think that the problem, well, for a variety of reasons, we'll never know. Um, not because there's some global conspiracy on the US to keep it undercover, which I don't know if you believe or don't believe, but probably because if that information did exist, I don't think China would want it to get out. And there's no fucking way they're gonna let other people into their country to figure that out. Yeah, um, no, they've already destroyed a lot of the evidence. So we know that. I don't know if that's true, fact. but regardless of the, the, regardless of the case- Biden of that, said it in has, a press conference a few days ago. I, I don't know if that's true. Yes, but regardless he did. okay, of the I'll send it to you, that, but. Regar regardless of the case of that, we are, there, there have been pandemics in the past there will probably be more in the future. What I'm more interested in is how do we respond to pandemics rather than like That's where fair. did it originate from? It, it is an interesting question, sure. Yeah, but um, but those are also two yeah, different fields of study. You realize that, right? Those, we're talking about two different things entirely. So it's important to do both. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Right. The science but I, but perspective is understanding where it came from and the political government perspective is understand, understanding how we responded to it. They're both very important. I but in terms I kind of, of studying like the virus, political. I feel like where it comes from is more a political question and the response is more a science based one. But but it's but OK, well, I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to keep harping on it. But if you just do a little bit of like research and understand into understanding why it's important where the virus originated, the reason is because, you know, why do you think that they do research on these viruses to begin with? Because they're trying to identify credible threats. They're trying to get a better understanding of how things evolve and mutate to infect humans. And so the part of the research is really just understanding the virus and how they evolve, which is important in our response to it. It's important in us creating vaccines and okay, medications for it. Okay, I'm gonna ask you a question then as an expert, okay? okay? Can you tell me if you sequence, if you completely sequence the genome of a virus, if, that, if at that point you've done that, why would it matter if you knew whether it was a bioweapon or it came from the wilderness, if you've already got like the entire gemonic sequence? Because you need to know how, okay, so first of all, a virus doesn't just have a genomic sequence. It's like, it's that, like that forever and ever and ever. Viruses evolve, you have different, you, you know this, they have different strands, they have different strains. So normally what happens is there's a bat coronavirus and that virus evolves in some way, mutates, hops to a human and then mutates and is able to infect a human. There's a lot of viruses out there that only infect animals. And the research comes from us wanting to know what viruses infect animals and how they mutate to affect humans. So you, you, okay, you don't just I'm need to know. So you, having the genome is just one piece quick. of the puzzle. You, 
you mentioned all the vaccines and everything, right? But even if you figure out that it came from bats, right? What, mm -hmm. what other, what important piece of that of information does that tell you for health reasons? <laughs> because you want to know what strain of virus came from the bat and how did it mutate to affect humans? You want, you, you already, need to don't know. Don't you already it. have the strain? Don't you already have the strain if you sequence the genome? There's, yes. What we need to know is so then why, why it matter where so we can try to prevent right? people from getting or, you know, we can also develop drugs. We can develop drugs to get. So there are people who do research wait, 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 on bats. Hold on, hold on, hold on, wait, hold on, wait, 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 hold on. Okay, because I've read a fuck ton about this. Okay, so have I. Okay, but I, <laughs> okay, that's great. So I'm. At, so when you say we develop drugs, uh -huh. why do you need to know where it came from in order to develop a drug? Okay, you have the full sequence and you okay. can study the virus. You can I, do. These I feel like this is vitro, really obvious. Okay, it's not so, very okay, obvious actually, me, but okay, we can have it. Okay. Yeah, go for it. Okay. okay, so there are people who work. For example, this is just one example. There are people who work in caves. They work in caves for all sorts of reasons. In the cave are bats, right? If someone gets bitten by a bat, they have to go to the hospital and the hospital has to evaluate them and try to determine, uh, and, and if, if possible, take the bat and, and they cut the bat's head off and they sample all parts of the bat to try to determine if there were any viruses that the person could get because it's very important to prevent a pandemic and pandemics begin this way, right? So they need to know what kind of viruses are in the bat population that are causing this need for concern. It's very important to understand, like the, the virus doesn't just begin at, well, here's a virus, let's deal with it. It begins at where did this virus come from? How do we look, how do we study these viruses? How do we study how they jump to humans and infect humans? Okay, what are so the viruses that are out there and where do they come from is really, really important. I don't know why that needs um, to be said. Because if you have the genomic sequence of a virus, and if you can study it in a petri dish, it doesn't really matter where it comes from when it comes to like developing vaccines or anything for it. Okay, what My about treatments like, for somebody who got bit by a bat? A bat. You're never, ever, ever going to figure that out in time. The, the they, standard treatment for somebody that gets bit by a bat. Not in is, time. No. God. Hold on. Damn wait, wait, wait. It. Hold on. Stop. Hold on. Okay. If you get bit by an animal like that, the standard treatment mm -hmm. is you go to a hospital and you get like, uh -huh. uh, uh, you do the rabies series of shots. Okay. That yes. You never go back to the cave and find the bat and then cut its head off to try to study potential. No, because you don't. I don't even what? know. No, yes, you I do actually. Well, like well, if you no, have the bat, like talking. if you killed it when it bit you, you should absolutely bring it to the lab. People do. I used to work, let me tell you, I used to work at a rabies testing lab. We used to cut the heads off of bats, so. How, yes, how long they does do, it do take that. To, to, how long does it take to figure out if the bat has rabies? Oh, it's a couple hours. What do you mean? You cut the head off and test the brain for rabies. Okay. Do you take every single potential coronavirus out of its body also and like try to test for all no, of that too? No, Destiny, or? you don't. That's why it's important to understand by, because there are also people who go to caves and collect bats to test this kind of sure, thing. I'm not, it's I'm important not to know. That. All I'm saying is that if you are given a virus. I'm not okay, arguing that. If no. you're given a virus, you don't need to know where it came from to develop a vaccine for it. That's all I'm saying. That, that doesn't. I, I wasn't that trying to claim that it was important for vaccine development, but it is okay, important for general understanding. I thought, I thought I heard initially for general understanding, sure. But it sounded to me like initially you said we need to know where it comes from for the development of like treatments and vaccines. Yeah, because wouldn't it be it great like if we had a vaccine ready for something that we knew was going to be an issue in humans ahead of time? We don't, or we, we had don't, the research? We, okay, we how do you think vaccines are developed? Wait, 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 oh my God, okay, hold on. We don't know what's going to be infectious okay, before right. it starts infecting humans. You can't know that by just looking That's at it. That's the point of the research, own. Steven. Listen, how do you think vaccines are developed? Do you think that a virus came out and they found the virus and sampled it and started from scratch with no research backing it? No, they had tons of research on bat coronaviruses. That's how they were able to manufacture the vaccine so quickly because they already had all of this evidence that they have done for decades of study and research in bat coronaviruses. No, hold on. Yes. The reason why what? these vaccines were manufactured so quickly is because the mRNA vaccine manufacturing process That's is part not the research no, but there's also the tons reason. of that research the, oh my god are you serious right now you don't think that research into bat coronaviruses plays a role in vaccine development for coronaviruses in humans maybe when it comes to like testing or figure out what works or doesn't but i don't know i'm just saying i don't know if you need to have the idea of where it came from exactly <laughs> you do because, though okay 
I, I mean, like respectfully, like you're, like you're just wrong. Like you, it is important, but okay, we can just. Okay, so to be clear, you, just to be all clear, you 100% conceded to me that if you have the Germanic secrets of the virus, you don't need to look at where it came from. That doesn't actually matter when not it comes to creating vaccines. Not necessarily to. Wait, wait, that's a yes or no question. I, you can't. I'm not going to yeah, let you Google that. No, okay? I mean, you do need to have an understanding of what kind of virus it is. Yeah, but it's wait, more wait, than what just kind the of, genomic wait, wait, no, 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 sequence. No, 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 Stop okay, wiggling. Like, you're wiggling. You're wiggling. It's because okay? it's such a complex clearly, issue. It's not a complex. It issue it's not yes. a complicated question right. absolutely is not so there, like if you me... have if you've if you've sequenced the virus and you have all of it and then you can start putting together vaccines that are emulating different protein structures on the virus you don't need to know where it came from in order to do that process okay. i don't know how it so, informs that process all right so like let's back up and talk about vaccine development okay so vaccines they um so or, or let, let's just talk about studying so you know that they're doing more than just making a vaccine you know that they're studying the virus as well right so when they get yeah, the virus thing, so, sure. so one of the reasons we can predict these different strains of virus is because we already have like so we put the the not just the dna sequence but we have computer renderings of the virus and all of the molecules and proteins in the virus Right. And we know the mRNA strands and we know where they tend to jump and mutate. And we have computer programs that can simulate all of this stuff. So just having the genome isn't really the full story. They put the entire structure of the virus into a computer and they model all of the different potential ways that it could mutate based on all sorts of things, based on what's known about bat coronaviruses and everything else. So how do you think that they're making vaccines? Uh, it, you, you don't think that they're already developing vaccines for variants that may pop up that aren't here yet? Because they are. Absolutely they already not. know. But I would be they really are. curious to re yes. I would be really <laughs> curious to see a single like source that actually says that they can predict what the next mutation can be. Okay, I absolutely so don't think that is the case. They can't, okay, so predicting it, so it's, it's not like they're gonna say 100%, this is where it's gonna mutate, but so the the mRNA strand, and, and I, I heard you talking about the, the mRNA viruses and the mRNA vaccine, so I know that you know like kind of a lot about how this stuff works, right? So when the, the, corona, when the coronavirus injects the mRNA into your, cell. That's the really important part. There's two really important parts of the virus, the spike protein and the mRNA that it transmits into the cell. Okay. The spike protein, if you look at a computer model of it, it's not a spike at all. That's just a name, a fancy name they came up. It's a folded protein with a specific genomic sequence. So when you say, you know, I guess you're talking about the genomic sequence of the mRNA that goes into our, our body. I assume that's what you're talking Wait, about. Wait, what is, can you, what does genomic sequence of a protein mean? Well, pro like so the proteins are formed out of molecules, right? And proteins the mRNA protein, that it injects what, in there on. is the genomic sequence that you're talking about, right? Like I'm I'm trying to okay, understand sure. what genomic sequence you're talking about. You're talking about the mRNA that's injected into the cell when the virus infects you, right? Sure. Yeah. Okay. The, the, yes. Okay. So the protein, the spike protein, is where the actual mutation occurs. So the mutation occurs, like, so there's the spike protein, the mRNA translates for the spike protein, right? So when the mRNA goes into your cell, there's random mutations that occur. Most of them don't do anything. Some of them make the virus ineffective completely, but some of them occasionally make the spike protein, which is a protein, right? More effective at entering your cell. Either it makes, it's like a puzzle, like a Tetris block, right? It makes it more effective at latching onto your cell and injecting the virus. That's how you end up with a variant that's more transmissible. Now, there's tons of variants that, that are, you know, just like moot, like they kill the virus or whatever, and it's all random. So when they have these computer models, they know exactly what a mutation in this part of the mRNA is going to do to the spike protein. So they can predict what kind of mutations would end up, I read a whole article on this. <laughs> That's how I know all of this. They, they know what kind of uh, mutations in the mRNA strand could result in a more infectious strain. So then they can take that and they can actually study it and decide like, you know, what do we think is going to be the most likely variant that could cause serious transmissibility in humans? And this is also why we know that it's highly unlikely that we're ever going to see a strand of this virus that results in like a 20% death rate. They already know that that's probably just, not going to happen. 
a, a mutation of the spike protein is only one part that could mutate. There's all sorts of like other ways that the yes, virus but the could spike mutate protein... in ways that it could potentially be more deadly so, or could potentially have okay. like other impacts on the body. Like the spike protein is just one sure, part of it. Sure, but the spike yourself. protein is really the most important part of the virus. And the, and the Delta virus, for example, mutation in the spike protein. That all the all the variants so far really have to do with mutations in the spike protein. Because that's how it gets into your cell and transmits it. So the easier it can get into your cell and transmit the virus, the better, right? I sent yeah, you the sure, article. Other like, I'm sure you would like I, I, be interested I've, in I've, it. I've, 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 I've... <laughs> okay. Um... <clears throat> we really, really got into the weeds on this one. But it's well, good We're time. not in the weeds at all. I, we're not in the weeds at all. <laughs> it's, we haven't even gotten to the weeds yet. Um, okay, I, I have to do like another show soon. And I think you need yeah, to like, get yeah. back to work. Yeah, I got to go back um, to work. Yeah. Um, is there any other final points you want to bring up or whatever? No. Um, basically, the bottom line of my stance is that as long as there's a risk, there should be a choice. I strongly disagree with especially federal mandates. Um, I think that it poses a you know conflict of interest concern. Um, I think that it's also not pragmatic in, in any way to uh, force a vaccine on people because I just don't think that people are going to want to do it. They're going to riot and there's going to be it's going to be a repeat of 2020. It's going to be a huge shit show. 100% against federal vaccine mandates. Really, I'm against a lot of mandating anything from the federal government, but especially vaccines. Um, I think it's an issue of personal autonomy, um, and I just don't think that people are going to do it. So, yeah. Gotcha. All right. Well, hey, listen, I really appreciate the discussion, all right? All right. It's always good to talk to you, Stephen. Proteins are made from your genome being transcri transcribed by ribosomes to basically 3D print the fucking thing. Sure. So, uh, so... <clears throat> RNA is read from your cells, or RNA reads your DNA. It creates things called messenger RNA. Those come out, they combine with, I think, transcription RNA or tRNA in a ribosome. And all the ribosome does is every time it reads, I think it reads three bases. And I think for every three bases read, an amino acid is made. And then it constructs like a little chain, like a protein after reading it all. And then once it's processed, it dissolves in your cell and then it, whatever. And that, these are what proteins are. I'm pretty sure that's my understanding of what proteins are, okay? Um, the, the, uh, my understanding is that once you have a virus, if you have the virus, and I'm just pushing on specifics because she kept saying that like, well, knowing where it comes from uh, is like really important. Um, once you have the virus and you can see like what it is, like you can start to create a vaccine based on the, based on the actual like sequences. You don't need to know where it came from at that point. I don't believe you need to. Or if you do, I've never heard how that process informs the mRNA vaccine manufacturing process. Like, oh, well, if it came from a bat, then we can change the, the vaccine this way. If it came from a dog, we can change the vaccine. I've never heard that before. Maybe that is the case. My understanding is that all the vaccines try to do is emulate the spike protein, that part that gains entry to your cell. It just tries to emulate that, print that out of your cells, and then have your vaccine, uh, and then have your uh, body develop an immune response to that. I'm only pushing back against these hyper-specific points because she kept trying to flaunt her qualifications like oh well i'm like really well researched and it's like okay if you are really well researched this blow my socks i want you to tell me exactly why does knowing it came from a bat or knowing it came from a chupacabra or whatever the fuck why would knowing that influence like how you develop vaccines um fuck i didn't want to get like so into the weeds on that but if somebody wants to get into the weeds that i will but i don't think it served the larger conversation but fuck they triggered the fuck out of me um the importance of knowing the population of coronavirus in the wild is that when we sequence a new viral epidemic, we use homology to existing viruses that have been sequenced to identify the spike program. Oh, okay. That could, that could be the case, sure. And having like a reference or a database of knowing where viruses come from could also be the case as well, sure. It felt like she was making arguments that she would later say was bad, but she's saying like these are arguments that other people were making, but then it felt like she was defending them. Like poor people can't take a day off of work. And it's like, well... But then could they take seven days? She's like, well, I'm not defending the argument. I'm just saying that is the argument. And it's like, <laughs> oh, God. Okay. I want to, I think I want to do more because I've read like, I've read so much about coronavirus, the vaccines, like the, the, the vaccine, like, I don't know what you would call it. Like in terms of how all these things work or whatever, I think I want to do more of these conversations in the, in the future. Um, because these are interesting to me, but I need to figure out if somebody's going to railroad that hard, I have to figure out like stopping points where it's like, and I wanted to do that. Every time she says it, I was like, okay, hold on, let's focus on this one thing. But it feels like when people do that, they'll like briefly address it and then they want to like jump off into like five other things. And it's so hard to, um, it's so hard to get somebody to like, okay, we're, let's focus on this one thing first before we move topics. She did bite the bullet on being against seatbelt mandate though. Sure, but the seatbelt mandate isn't even necessarily the same as like a, um, as a vaccine mandate because seatbelts are technically to keep yourself safe, not other people, right? Um, also, I blue balled all of you on the JLP thing. I'm so sorry about that. Um, but the um, they, they they don't want me to stream that, so that's not going to be on stream at all. Sorry. <laughs>
With Joe Rogan saying that Corona shit, ain't we all fuck? Um, August wants me to go through videos and like do research on stream to show you guys like how I find stuff or whatever. I, I might do that. And actually, the most recent thing comes from Joe Rogan's like the, um, the Joe he does like a 15 minute thing. It says Joe's COVID experience, CNN's ivermectin claims. But um, I want to go through these on stream live. I don't want to do like pre prep for this so that you can get an idea of like, oh, well, this is how I look at this. This is how I research this. And this is what I look for this. Like, yeah, I'm trying to be more like um, not conciliatory. Like a little bit more nice. Oh, fuck. I don't know. Okay. Because I almost, right at the beginning, I almost like launched into like very harsh. Because as soon as she said, like, oh, well, I worked in a lab, I really wanted to, okay, hold on. I need your exact job title. I need to know what you did. Because I've talked to people that have come onto this stream before that have been like, oh, like I'm working on like my PhD in like fucking virology or some shit. And when they talked, I felt very clearly like out of my depth. I was like, okay, you seem to know a lot of shit about what you're talking about. Um, which I don't think was the case <laughs> in this conversation. Oh, okay. It felt like she is an anti-vaxxer, but she's shielding some criticism with her bullet, with her blood clot. What's up? Um, yeah, we started thinking like an hour and a half. An hour and a half. I think it's when we start, yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Science is saying that viruses get weaker and weaker every mutation. So after two years, we get all the people. Well, I wonder what is the, wait. So, hold on. Oh, God. There are actually so many antivirus, like Zoomer and Millennials now. I can't believe how mind fucked you fucking moron, Scott. It actually blows my fucking mind. Science is saying that viruses get weaker and weaker with every mutation. I don't think science says that. I don't know what the fuck that means. So after almost two years and with all the job people, we have more folks in hospitals than last year. I wonder what is the reason for that. May someone enlighten me, please. It's The reason why is because we're rolling back like the mask and the distancing mandates, and so people are going out again and like getting more infected. It's not that complicated. It's not like this is happening out of nowhere. Ugh. Ugh. Okay. Did she say that pharma companies advertise drugs before approval? Yeah, and then, and the problem is like sticking in like so many fucking claims. I don't know her one story of the one drug, so I have to look that up. But she'll, she'll say like one thing, but then pair like five others. Like, oh, like there's like misincentives and you know, and people bribe and blah, blah. And it's like, wait, wait, hold on, wait, 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 wait. Those are two, there's like so many different claims in here. When you said that there might be like uh, corruption potential or whatever, and then you say people bribe each other. Okay, wait, hold on. Well, that's like a totally separate thing that has to be addressed. She slipped back into saying they put a lot of money in development. Yeah, and I don't think you can advertise drugs in, in trials. I think you, you might be able to advertise for trials, but I don't think you can say like, oh, go ask your doctor about this drug today. By the way, it's not FDA approved. Like, can you go a little bit in depth about the mRNA vaccine differences than the normal ones? My aunt keeps going on and on about how they're new. And we don't know how we're gonna react to it in a few years. The side effects that could happen in a few years. Okay. I'm going to like, okay, I'm gonna explain this as many times as I have to. I don't care if it's a fucking repeat and I'll ban people who say it's a repeat, okay? Traditionally, what you do with a vaccine is you take a, like somehow, I don't know how exactly, you take some weakened form of the virus or some less virulent form of the virus, you inject that into your body and you let it do kind of an infection, but it's weakened so your body can get like a practice like fighting it, right? The virus goes in, it does a little bit of infection, you fight it off and that's how like a traditional, um, that's how a traditional vaccine works. works. Um, so for instance, the J&J &J vaccine I believe does this. Um, the uh, AstraZeneca uh, vaccine does this. this is like typically like how um, how a vaccine works. The difference between the mRNA virus uh, vaccines, the difference between the mRNA vaccines is instead of actually injecting a vaccine or a virus into your body, what it does is when the virus gets into your body, it's like this little, it's like an mRNA like strand or an RNA strand that's like wrapped in a bunch of shit that has a protein coming out. The way that your cells work is your cells don't have eyes, okay? They can't see shit. All right. Um, so what cells do is on the outside, they have a bunch of little like gates and feelers and shit to like figure out like what goes in me and what can't go in me. Okay. And the way that the virus gains entry to a cell is it's got a little, like a little feeler called a spike protein. And that's the thing that searches and binds. It, it binds onto something on a cell. This is called the ACE2 receptor. It binds into that. And then once it's bound into that, it, pff, it splurges its a uh, um, viral shit into your cell and it makes a, and, and that's how it makes you sick. Right? What the mRNA vaccine does is all it does is it goes into this, it, it, it uses this, 
it uses a similar entry, it gets into your cell, and then what happens is, is your cell starts to manufacture one part of the virus called the spike protein. That's it. That's only the little arm thing, okay? Once your cell begins to manufacture just that spike protein, your antibodies recognize it, or no, I'm sorry, your immune system recognizes it, it produces antibodies, and then it clears that infection, but you're never actually infected with a virus. The only thing you've ever made in your body is a little spike protein that resembles the spike protein of the virus. So if the, um, so if you get infected in the future and that virus is floating around, that little spike protein, your body will recognize it quicker and generate an immune response. That's, yeah. <clears throat> Um, yeah, sometimes for vaccines you can have uh, like adenovirus vaccines or you can have like attenuated vaccines. So the um, the the J and J and the um, AstraZeneca ones, I don't think they use like a live form of the virus. Um, I, there, there's I haven't looked, I haven't read as much into them. I've, most of the shit I'm reading is on the mRNA stuff. So I don't know if they inject like a live version of it or if it's a dead version or if it's an attenuated version or whatever. I can't, but you can go and read that. But the mRNA ones are the ones that people like freak the fuck out all the time about. Destiny, dumb question. Can't that spike protein production go out of control and be just as bad as the virus? No, because the spike protein doesn't make you sick. It just doesn't belong in your body, right? It doesn't, but it can't make you sick. The spike protein is just the little part that the virus uses to get into your body. Once the spike protein is like connected into a cell and then the, um, and then the virus like injects itself into your cell, that's when it begins to replicate the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which, which causes a whole bunch of bad shit to happen. But the spike protein itself can't make you sick. The reason why you get sick is because a lot of the a lot of the um, sick stuff that happens in your body isn't caused by a virus. It's caused by your body's immune response to the virus. So, for instance, the reason why we get um, fevers is because it's thought that bacteria or viruses have a harder time replicating when the temperature of your body raises. So, if you raise the temperature of your body up to like 100 degrees, 101, 102, that your body has more time to fight off. Uh, the infection because the virus or the bacteria have a harder time replicating or whatever, right? This is why you uh, get a fever or, you know, your lymph nodes get swollen or you feel nauseous. Like these are all like um, immune responses that your body has. These aren't being caused by a virus. <clears throat> what if your cells dodge all the mRNA DNA? Highly unlikely. This is the reason why you're injected in your muscle. The reason why you're injected in the muscle is because you're, near your muscles is where most of the beds of capillaries are. Capillaries are the smallest vessel of blood transport in your body. You get injected there. Highly likely that there's going to be a lot of uptake there. And then those are the cells that get infected. And then you're uh, like, well, yeah. <clears throat> is mRNA better than normal vaccines? It depends. The problem is that well, there's one thing. One, it's nice because mRNA vaccines are ultra fucking quick to make. We just need one protein, ideally at least with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, you just need one protein to make the, the vaccine and then you're ready to go. So like the mRNA vaccines were made in like one to two days, which is nice. But the second thing, there's a con to that, is that if your body has fought off the actual virus, is it like 20 to 40 um, different proteins? Is it how many proteins? How many proteins in SARS-CoV-2? Is it like 20 or 40 or how, am I totally off on this? Hold on. It's like 30, okay, 29 proteins. If your body gets infected by the actual SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, then your body is getting to recognize all sorts of different proteins of that virus to develop an immune response for. So an actual SARS-CoV-2 infection is going to yield greater immunity than just the mRNA vaccines. So if you get an mRNA vaccine, you're only training your body to fight that one type of protein. So you're not gonna have as great the recognition. However, even if you've been infected, getting a vaccine after getting infected will still yield greater immune response than just having the infection. But yes, an actual infection um, will give you more immunity than just having the mRNA vaccine. But if you get the mRNA vaccine and then get actually infected, now you get all the benefits of having seen the actual virus. So your body can develop even more responses to these foreign proteins, but also, um, but also you don't have the disease as severely as well. Why is the vaccine less effective against the Delta variant then? Is it because Delta, the Delta uses a different spike protein? Um, I don't know if there's been evolution on the spike protein. I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I'll, I can look that up later. Like, I don't know like the underlying like, biomechanical reason. How do side effects factor into mRNA vaccines? The side effects are gonna be whatever your body produces um, and then like what, or whatever your body's immune reaction I think is theoretically. But there, there might be, 
There's one, I'm trying to think, there's one insane fucking Canadian doctor that was trying to say that the foreign mRNA from the mRNA vaccine can like end up in your brain or some shit. I don't, I'm trying to remember what this guy, this dumb fuck's name was. It was one of these, it's one of these conspiracy theories that I researched upstream. I don't remember what his name was, but some people have made these crazy claims that like the mRNA will get like buried or the spike proteins will lodge into like vessels all over your body and cause like, um, like uh, the, the, this vessel degradation like 10 years from now or something. I don't know if that's ever been substantiated anywhere, but. Oh, nature article. August 20th, a key amino acid change might underlie the coronavirus variant's ferocity infect or ferocious infectivity. The adenovirus carries the DNA for the spike protein. It is extremely similar to the mRNA vaccine. Oh, really? It doesn't have any of the other proteins or whatever? The thing is, is I don't know how much that, I don't know how much that spike protein can change because it's a really important thing because that's how the, um, that's how the, um, that's how the virus gets into your body. That, that, that spike protein is really, really, really important. Um, however, there are ways that it could change to be more infectious. This was one of the, um, this is part of the preliminary research on whether or not it was man-made had to do with the analysis of that spike protein. Um, because one of the early arguments, um, one of the early arguments against it being man-made was that we have a pretty good understanding of different ways that viruses can get into the cell. And when researchers were breaking apart this virus under uh, in the laboratory, um, one of the things they said is like, if you wanted to make a virus more infectious, there are other vectors that are probably more appropriate to take. The ACE2 binding site is not really the best way to do it. Like that's like, historically, I think our understanding is that like, that's not like the best route to go if you're trying to gain access to a cell with a virus. So it seems unlikely that humans would modify a virus to enter her through that gateway. Um, there is an early study for why it was probably not man-made. Now these are just like guesses, of course, but this was published, I think, like a year ago. Um, the first argument also was that there was only a little chance of getting COVID and thus losing days off from work, but everyone, eventually everyone who is not vaccinated will be infected here. Oh, potentially, yeah, which sucks, man. From the Brett Weinstein slash Dr. Pier, Pier, Pieri, Corey, J-R-E, the way the vaccine is supposed to work is it's supposed to be injected into the injection site. It's supposed to have the mRNAs or the DNA enter the cell, triggers the production of spike protein. The spike protein is supposed to move to the surface of the cell and it's supposed to stay there. It has a domain and it's supposed to stick into the cell surface where the immune system is supposed to see and, and learn it, right? No, oh wait, are you just copy pasting from the video? Now the fact is the components of the vaccine do not stay in the injection site and the spike proteins do not stay locked to the cell surface. Maybe some of them do, but Many of them seem to float around the body. So we have this molecule, which is based on a COVID molecule or SARS-CoV-2 molecule that is cytotoxic that circulates around the body. The evidence that it actually shreds the blood-brain barrier. So it opens the pulse of the brain. This is what I saw the Canadian doctor um, that he was like saying this. I don't think there's been any research for that. I think it's just a theory. It's an idea. Maybe this might happen. Um, that's something to look into in the future, but there's like been no evidence of this happening so far that like that spike protein will float around your body and go through the blood-brain barrier and like shed, like cause like prions to form and like, bury itself into all of your blood vessels, give you heart problems and shit, yeah. Can we know if the vaccines will have side effects a few years from now without waiting the years? I mean, you probably can't know for sure, but I mean, like, I don't think there's ever been vaccine side effects that have happened after two months. I don't think that has, like, ever happened. If you had a choice, which vaccine would probably be the best to take? I think the mRNA technology is really, really, really the fucking fam. cool. The concept of, like, the mRNA technology is a really fucking awesome concept. Like, on a from a biological level, um, JC from YouTube chat. Thank you for gifting the cells, dude. Just from a biological level, the idea of like hijacking the cells' ribosomes to manufacture like one specific protein that your like immune system could train against, that's an awesome concept. It's really, really sick. Like on the like on the really low like molecular level, like how all that shit works. I like the mRNA technology. I think it's cool. I got the Pfizer one twice. I'll probably take a booster if I can, because why the fuck wouldn't I? Um, yeah, I, I think that's awesome. Did you see the link about mRNA being able to fight cancer? Yeah, I've heard of potential mRNA vaccines for HIV as well, but why do we need boosters? Um, your immune system naturally wanes over time. Like, it just depends on the infection. Sometimes you, you, there's like a waning immunity. I don't know if we'll need boosters or not. That hasn't been determined yet. I feel yet, like I've but... outpaced him intellectually. Prion, not prion. Sorry, prion. Oh, so it is Thank you, Steve. It is a mutation on the spike protein. Pog champ, pog champ, pog champ. <laughs> You and her both wanted as many people as possible to get vaccinated. Do you agree that her rhetoric is more effective in changing anti-vaxxer opinions? No, I don't think you can start conceding grants and like, oh yeah, well, you know, the FDA has a lot of corruption or like, you know, some people don't want to miss a day. I, I, th I think that I feel very confident that I can have conversations with anti-vaxxers and be like, 
pretty effective at changing their mind without having to make like those types of those levels of concessions. Can we make predictions about how viruses will mutate? Is that possible? I mean, I, I feel like I've outpaced. I'm sure, like intellectually. hypothetically, that's possible. But like, is is our technology really that advanced that we can start folding like tons of proteins and figure out like, oh yeah, like this will, um, this mutation will occur? Here. It feels like if you were studying a virus, it feels like there could be like a million potential mutations across like any number of proteins to figure out like, or like I don't know. This doesn't seem to be very worthwhile. But I feel like I've outpaced him intellectually. But I, but maybe it is. I've just I've never heard that before.